All right, I'm here with theologian Carl Truman, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of his books. But first, welcome to the show. I'm glad you could be here. We are here at the Diocese of the Anglican Words Diocesan Convention, where you, not an Anglican, have appeared. Welcome. It's great to be here. <laughs> now, you're here because you've written a couple new, uh, new books that are really interesting, and uh, I got to read over the last week, and it'd be fun to talk about. But uh, in a such, your books cover topics about what's going on in, in today's age, the age of self, the age of, uh, you know, id for, for better purposes. And I really, need, re really want to talk about something like that. Um, how did you get into this idea that somebody needs to put this in book form? Yeah, it's a long story. There were, I was a pastor at the time when I started to think about the book. Mm -hmm. So I was facing certain pastoral questions, particularly about why young people think very differently about issues of sex and gender mm -hmm. to people of my generation. Uh, I was also caught up in a, something of a conflict over transgender bathroom policy in the mm -hmm. local school district where I was living. And thirdly, and perhaps most uh, irrelevant of all, is I was looking for something new to write on. I'm a Reformation academic by background. I'd been teaching and writing on Reformation mm -hmm. for nearly 30 years at that point. So wow. when a new topic came up, it interested me. And I focused the work really initially on why is it that the question or the statement, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, has become plausible, not just to people attending queer theory, postdoctoral seminars, but to ordinary men and women in the street. Well, it's not the <clears> first <throat> time this type of thought has occurred to man. I think, therefore I am. You know. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think we, one of the things that we need to do with something like the transgender question is realize it doesn't emerge out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. That it emerges out, particularly out of the, of the last three, four, five hundred years of Western culture, where we have placed an increasing emphasis and granted a greater and greater authority to our inner feelings. Human beings have always had inner feelings. Sure. You read the Psalms, you read the Iliad, you read the Odyssey, you read ancient poetry. Human beings have always felt things. One of the significant shifts of the last uh, couple of hundred years, though, is that we've begun to grant more and more decisive significance to those feelings. We have. We've made them facts. Yeah. Okay, my first, second year in college, I took an a abnormal psychology class, Dr. Graff. And Dr. Graff had me on the first day, had all students write on the first page, feelings are not facts. And then we had a, a good semester of learning about uh, abnormal psychology. And then the last page, he had me write the same thing. Yeah. And I think now we've lost that understanding. Yeah. You know, feelings change. And uh, facts usually don't change as much as feelings do. Yeah, yeah. And w we've lost that ability to say, well, today I feel like a man, tomorrow I feel like a canary. You need to, to affirm both of those. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and part of that, of course, is we have this cult of personal happiness now, mm -hmm. where we tend to identify personal happiness as me feeling good about myself. Mm -hmm. And anything that gets in the way of me feeling that way is therefore problematic. We still thankfully ascribe some limits to that. You know, the, the serial killer who feels happy because they kill people, we, we find that unacceptable. But a, as long as we think that our happiness is not impinging on the happiness of other people, then everything's okay. Okay, well, it's <clears throat> 2024 and trans, trans surgery is normalized. Uh, certainly here in America, over in uh, Europe, they're slowly stopping it. They said, you, know, you said, research says don't do it. Yeah. The, the, they will change. They'll yeah. go back to their normal understanding of their body. But here in America, we still want to empower them. Yeah. And in doing so, we've almost made a world where Fred, Frederick Nietzsche, Nietzsche is right. Yeah. You know, or you know, Karl Marx is right. Um, that y you can be the ultimate you. Yeah. Yeah, the idea of normative limits that apply to all of us and that you know, come with being a human or, or come from outside and are imposed upon our will, very, very problematic. And I think in American culture, the, the strong emphasis upon individualism, which for, for centuries was a strong point. It was one of the things that made America great, that it led to the rugged pioneer spirit, the can-do attitude. Uh, the willingness to, to start again in the face of setbacks. That individualism that was a real strength for many centuries 
has proved at this particular cultural moment to be a real Achilles heel. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, there was an Italian philosopher, Augusto del Noce. Mm -hmm. He's a Catholic philosopher. And he made the comment that the sexual revolution that was then accelerating in Europe would do more damage to American culture than any other culture in the world. And he added this, this strange end to that. He said it will do more damage, not despite America's Puritan heritage, but because of America's Puritan heritage. And what he meant was that, that tremendous em uh, emphasis upon freedom of personal conscience would actually prove to be problematic in what was emerging. That's because we've always <clears throat> understood here in the West you can have freedom without consequence. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and so if I can have a sex change without consequence, yeah. that's cool. If I can have sex without consequence, yeah. that's cool. Um, and we have voided ourselves of uh, putting a consequence to our action. Yeah. It's a, a, a total Western thing, Europe yeah. and, and yeah. here in America. That is destruction. Yeah, and it's very technologically enabled as well because we think that way, again, because one of the great strengths of the West has been uh, technological innovations. Mm -hmm. It paved the way for the Industrial Revolution, created more wealth and a higher standard of living than, than anybody else has ever experienced yeah. on the face of the earth. But it also unleashed tremendous powerful forces that play to this myth that we are autonomous and mm -hmm. sovereign individuals. Well, the definition of technology <clears throat> is the application of knowledge. Mm, it's yeah. not the application of truth. Yeah. And we fall so short in understanding that just because you can do something, you should do something. Yeah. Uh, we can um, treat a women's breast cancer. Yeah. Oh, it's awesome. We can put women's breast on a man. Ooh, yeah. that's so awesome. Yeah. And so we just don't know what, when to say no. Anymore. No. Uh, and part of the problem is, of course, that. Uh, you use the example of medical science there. I think we've seen a shift again over the last century from uh, in medicine where medicine was restorative. Mm -hmm. you know, if somebody's born with, with one limb missing, we give them a prosthetic limb. We restore what should be there but isn't there. Uh, has become more and more transformative in that, okay, the body's raw material. What would we like to do with it? How strong would we like it to be? How brilliant would we like the brain to be? The body's become just the initial raw material that technology can then transform into something you know, superhuman, we might say. I, and I think this was pretty evident early on in the HIV crisis that we had mm. here, where um, they wanted the cure, their solution, yeah. where an initial cure would have been to stop uh, the activity that caused yeah. the transmission. Yeah. Um, and you know, I'll probably be taking off every social media platform for saying that, but the, you know, if you wanted to stop something uh, from killing you and there was an ability yeah. to do it by stopping uh, the activity that caused the transmission, yeah. would you pursue that? And clearly the stats indicated they didn't want, to, they did not want that to be part of the solution. Well, it's an interesting question actually because the, uh, the gay community was itself divided in the 80s. There were those within the gay community who essentially saying, we need to change our behavior. Right. We, we need to close the bathhouses, yeah. we need to cut down the promiscuity in order to address the, the problems created by this disease. They lost, within the gay community, they lost the argument. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we live in a very, we live in an age where by and large moral problems have been reframed as technical problems. Mm -hmm. And that means that the solution is not a moral solution, it's a technical solution. Let's get back to your book. You wrote a book, I've, it's a long title, the title is? Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And in as such, uh, I'm up to chapter eight. Okay, you, I, I'm short, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Tell me uh, what happens chapter eight after we talk about this. But you, going back, and it's not really a forensic look at the past, but you say, how did we get here? Yeah. And it, it's not, it didn't happen overnight. It may have seemed it. Uh, I remember my first conversation with uh, my daughter brought home a, a friend who thought he was trans, and he said, I'm a girl, I want you to call me a him, her. Mm. And, okay, it's a phase. Mm. And, and back when I first met him, it was a phase. A week later, he didn't want to be called, mm. uh, you know, he just wanted the attention. Um, in the 90s and the early 2000s, it was a, a, fa a fad. Mm. It's no longer a fad. Yeah. And how did we get here to I, go from yeah. a possible fad yeah. to utter destruction? 
I think there are a couple of things. One, uh, the, the role of social media is very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see this, you know, where, where does the trans issue really explode as a big issue? It's around about 2015, mm -hmm. which is around about the same time that social media is becoming a thing. So there's it's definite fun, sure. social contagion dimension to it. I think there's a, it, it's not unrelated to the weakening of, of traditional institutions. You know, people like to belong. Mm -hmm. And being trans becomes a way of, of belonging. It is, yeah. um, thirdly, I think that the, one of the things that caught me completely off guard was that the trans issue has become predominantly an issue affecting young teenage girls who think they're boys. Mm -hmm. Growing up, the only trans people I'd ever met were guys who thought they were women. Sure, absolutely. It's now a young teenage girl phenomenon. And I think the issue there, of course, is, well, it's not unusual for young teenage women to be very uncomfortable in their own bodies. Mm -hmm. We saw it in the 80s and 90s yes, with anorexia and yeah. bulimia. Uh, the difference between then and now is this. Now, we have, then everybody, medical establishment and government, saw that anorexia and bulimia were bad. Now we have governments whose uh, approach to policy has been profoundly shaped by powerful lobby groups. And that means that we are pathologizing in the wrong ways this in what should be in some ways a fairly routine sort of body dysmorphia that the young girl will grow out of it's been made a political course it's been pathologized and the government and the medical establishment are all on the wrong side of the issue the, the, I think they ended up on the wrong side of the issue because of cancel culture yeah they would stand up and say uh, wait a minute oh pff, you're out of here <clears throat> I don't think we should don't no, you're out of here yeah and that cancel culture stopped uh, scientists, uh, med medical people, and Christians from yeah. speaking up. It stifled but, debate you know, that needed to take place. Uh, so we lost probably 12 years of good argument. Yeah. And that leaves us a dozen years yeah. behind. Uh, is that something we can catch up on? I think so. I mean, uh, you, you alluded to Europe. There's some very significant moves coming in Europe. They're indicating that, you know, again, we, we need to distinguish different types of gender dysphoria. But I think the, the rapid onset gender dysphoria, that which affects young, you know, young teenagers. Yeah. The 12 year girl. Uh, I think yeah. a consensus is emerging in many significant parts of Europe that that, that is, you know, the treatment for that by hormones, surgery, that's bogus. Mm -hmm. It's bogus stuff. That will come here because at some point somebody is going to be detransitioning and they're going to sue the doctors, the pharmaceutical companies, mm -hmm. maybe even their own parents. Mm -hmm. And there are scientific reports emerging in Europe now which will be useful in those legal challenges. So mm -hmm. I think the craze as we see it now will be considerably diminished in the next decade, probably as a result of, of legal actions. Mm -hmm. For those uh, who are suffering from a more long-standing form of gender dysphoria, I think we need to think about ways of, of long-term care and support and help for those people that don't involve traumatic and dramatic surgeries and treatments, but do involve acknowledging the pain being felt by these people is very, very real. It's very long-standing. It's not something that's just going to go away tomorrow. Mm. Particularly, how do we as a church gather around and support such people as they, as they move towards their true identity? Yeah, I mean, we have a churches now that are just barely letting people with tattoos in. Yeah. You know, we're not really accepting yeah. the things that are, are, are strange to us. And to find a person in your pew now who changed their uh, sexual body um, is looking for help. Yeah. What does the church do? Yeah. Huh, you're screwed. That's not yeah. the answer. And it's, yeah, I know. <laughs> Everybody's on a steep learning curve here yeah. because it's happened so quickly mm -hmm. and it is such a devastating and dramatic thing. I think we have to bear with each other patiently on this because some things are going to be tried in the church that, that aren't right and mm -hmm. don't work, but we don't know that at the time. Yeah, I, well, I think the greatest thing here is we found a, a cult here in culture. Mm. It's not that the kids are seeking it as much as the cult is seeking them. Yeah. You know, I can prove transgenderism is a real thing by getting more yeah. uh, to perform surgeries. Yeah. And I guess they cut, they say break an egg, you know, yeah. uh, to, to get to either them and convince them. Uh, the transgender people that I've spoken to in very honest relationship, what made you convince you that you were transgendered? And they would say transgender voices convinced me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, so that, that's, that's their evangelism. Yeah. That's their, their way to get 
what they need out of the society. Yeah. And parents, I think, need to be aware there are a lot of what we call trans coaching videos mm -hmm. online. Yeah. Uh, encouraging kids to be trans, encouraging kids to use certain strategies to get their parents Don't on board with the yeah, problem. Yeah. So I think it's, it, it's, it would be good for parents to be aware of what's going on because it is out there and it's very predatory in a lot of ways. Okay. <clears throat> we almost got to this. It didn't start yesterday. How did you think this started? Um, uh, well, the tried answer would be what well, starts at the fall. Yes. Uh, well, obviously, Adam uh, and Eve. Yeah. Did God yeah. really say that? Okay, that's where it started. But, but I think in <laughs> the modern issue really begins, I think, in the 19th century, when technology combines with a certain authorization of, of inner feelings. These kind of factors come together mm -hmm. that really help to to drive a downplaying of the significance of the physical body on mm -hmm. a whole host of fronts. So I would say. The, the things really start to accelerate at the end of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, I mean, that was kind of a beginning to materialism. That was yep. a beginning to uh, more advancements in science. And that was a beginning to know that I can uh, work and live without the, side, the understanding that there is a God. Mm. And so if there is no God, I can be the God. Yeah. Autonomy becomes a whole lot more plausible mm -hmm. when you have a lot of technology at your mm -hmm. disposal. Okay. There were some writers at the time, theologians, not really, uh, philosophers. Let's talk about Frederick Nietzsche, Nietzsche uh, Karl uh, Marx, and a few others that were influential in this. Yeah. Well, Nietzsche is, is in some ways the man of the modern age, and mm -hmm. that he's the guy who really understands that if you get rid of God, then human beings really need to assert their own freedom and autonomy. We need to create our own meanings. Mm -hmm. We need to step into the role that was once played by God. And that means that's both a terrifying burden, but also an exhilarating form of freedom. Uh, Marx is similar in some ways in that, again, he, where, where Nietzsche and Marx sort of overlap is they both have an, you know, uh, uh, the idea that claims to truth made in the here and now are attempts to oppress. It comes down to power. So, for example, the assertion that maleness is normative for a certain kind of body could be an oppressive mm -hmm. statement. So Marx and Nietzsche are, are very similar on that front. And you've alluded to materialism. We have a strong uh, uh, strand of thought in the 19th century. Auguste Comte would be a, a yeah. good example uh, that goes against any sort of notion of what we were, you know, broadly called metaphysics the idea that the, the world has some sort of meaning or shape to it beyond that which we can see. A meaning increasingly becomes something in the 20th century that we construct for ourselves. It's not something we discover in the world or the universe around us. And all these thinkers play their role in the development sure. of that idea. We should, we'll get to Sigmund Freud in a minute, but Frederick Nietzsche went yeah. crazy in later life Yeah. when he saw a horse being beaten. Yeah. And I always wondered what... Did, what drove him crazy? The fact that it's no longer good or bad to beat a horse? Or that he believed it was bad yeah. and that he had to acknowledge there is a God? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> I mean, certainly he seems to have been suffering from mental illness mm. for some months before oh, that. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's an interesting yeah. question. Yeah. Sigmund Freud, yeah. probably the worst of the worst as far as who listened to him and mm. brought him forth in society. Yeah. Well, Freud, actually, I, Freud isn't the worst of the worst. It's the way his ideas are picked up and used. And okay, that, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. And that Freud really, you know, Freud thinks that human beings are fundamentally defined by our sexual desires. Mm -hmm. But where he goes with that is the, that means that sexual codes, the things that restrict our expressions of those desires, are very important for maintaining civilization. What happens to Freud is that, if you may want to put it at a popular level, the first part is grasped, the idea that, yet, we are fundamentally sexual beings, and to be truly authentic, we need to express those sexual feelings in action. That's grasped, but the idea that the sexual codes we have are good things, that's effectively abandoned. Mm -hmm. um, intellectually, it's a number of Marxist thinkers who do that, but in the broader culture, I think pop culture does that. You know. uh, movies, sitcoms, Soap operas all present this idea that to be a fulfilled human being means having an active, fulfilling sex life. And it's very Freudian and uh, plays very much into the kind of revolutionary sexual times in which we now live. Sure. In, in, innuendo. All right, so you, you tell me what happens after page or chapter eight now. 
you know, do you have hope for us? Yeah, I do. I think the church is the, is the source of hope in this. Um, in that, you know, if the problem is that, that, that society has lost its vision intellectually and practically of what it means to be a human being, mm -hmm. the community where that can be embodied and enacted and displayed to the world is the church community. And you know, might say, well, that sounds like a rather simplistic, naive approach. Well, two things. One, uh, we know that there are supernatural promises attached to the church. So it's not a matter of technique. It's actually a matter of supernatural promise. And secondly, if you understand how the church in the first and second century uh, came to sort of overrun the empire just 200 years later, mm -hmm. the Roman Empire 200 years later, you'll realize it was precisely through the church being the church that that occurred. Mm -hmm. Yes, we hope. Yeah. I do want to thank you for your time. It's uh, been Dr. a pleasure. Dr.